Hey everyone, I'm Adam Orth. Welcome to the Game Maker's Notebook. Today I'm speaking with narrative designer Meghna Jayanth, and in this episode we discuss Meghna's childhood moving around from Saudi Arabia, the UK, and India, and how those experiences shaped her worldview, the unique aspect of writing for games and the amorphous nature of creative work, the authenticity and the home life of the characters in Thirsty Suitors, the economics of game development, how funding affects risk, creativity, and the emergence of brand new voices, and most importantly, how Thirsty Suitors takes players through an emotional journey via its unique narrative and gameplay systems. Hope you enjoy. Magna, welcome to the Game Maker's Notebook. I'm so excited to be here and have this conversation with you. Yeah, um, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, I just finished Thirsty Suitors last night, so looking forward to talking to you about that. I mm -hmm. have a lot of stuff to talk about that. I, I love the game. Um, it, it hit me emotionally and, it, you know, as a gamer... I loved it. Um, lots of stuff to talk about. Um, well, I can't. I can't wait, and uh, I'm so happy you uh, enjoyed your time with it. Yeah, yeah, it was really, really cool, and um, it's awesome to see um, the kind of world reacting to it. So, congrats on all the success and the positive reviews, and just getting a game like there, like that, out into the world because uh, it's very special, very different. Thank you. There's, um, there's, there's really, there's a lot of heart in it. Um, uh, and there's a lot of love in it <laughs> and, you know, and, and we're a small team. The team's about sort of 15. We worked on it for three and a half years. So it's been really, um, strange, like nerve wracking, but exciting to like finally put it out there. And I think the thing that I love about it most is, you know, when watching streams, unlike many of the other games I've worked on, you always end up finding out something personal about the streamer <laughs> as they play it because it's such um it's such a kind of grounded re real story in a way despite being super surreal and over the top um and people often end up revealing things about their own dating lives or their own family situations and you know that's 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 been really wonderful yeah um when i was playing it it, it you know we'll get into it later but it, it brought me back to my childhood in very unexpected ways. Really? And I also saw a lot of myself in, in, in the main character. In oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, good and bad. So we'll, we'll dig into that. Um, mm -hmm. But very, yeah. uh, a very surprising and interesting um, game. I mean, not surprising. I've been following it for a long time, but the way it affected me and the way uh, I enjoyed it was, Made me even more excited to talk today. So here we are. Fabulous. Um, so let's uh, let's go back a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. You've been doing this a while. Um, you've worked on Nearly some great titles. I know. Yeah. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn, mm -hmm. This War of Mine, Sunless Skies and Seas, Boyfriend Dungeon, yeah. Falcon Age, Sable, 80 mm -hmm. Days, and of course, Thirsty Suitors. Um, yeah. Yeah. I went on your website uh, in my in my research for this Do I have uh, a podcast. Uh, kind of, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I think it needs updating. <laughs> yes. uh, <laughs> I've, I've forgotten. I, I have no idea which one you're even referring to. I think it's pink. Um, oh, that doesn't narrow it down. Yeah. Um, oh, I think it was the one that I just my card 
you know, the, yeah, the, I think, we throw I think up when we thought Twitter is. was going to die and it just kind of clicks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, on that, on that website, mm-hmm. using air quotes for those not watching, mm-hmm. um, it says you design contextual narratives yeah. and build worlds counter to capitalist colonist fantasies while thinking about video games and culture. You're focused on narrative design yeah. and decolonization in the indie space. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in the indie space and yeah, most of my work is in the indie space. Obviously, Horizon Zero Dawn is the one one little exception, <laughs> brief foray into into kind of AAA. Um, but yeah, I think you know, it's such a, it's such a young medium. And I think that's something that we sometimes kind of forget. Right. And there's this idea that, oh, what we've already done, um, the kinds of mechanics, the the kinds of approaches, um, that we've already explored, uh, is the, is the limit of kind of creative possibility here. Um, and I think that's why I really love working in indie because there's all of this space for experimentation, um, and re- rethinking, I think some of the, you know, the, the, the white man with a gun, you know, as, as the kind of fundamental protagonist of, of video games, um, and narratives of like exploitation or, um, domination, all of these things, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, and Thirsty Suitors is also the first time I've, you know, Outer Loop is a minority led studio and it's my first time working on a team like so closely with, other brown people and, and queer folks. And, you know, I do think the whole team is really engaged in that kind of work. And, and I do think that that really shows. Uh, totally agreed. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, white man with the gun. Just, yeah. <laughs> boy, we've, we've done that to death. Exactly. Right. You know, so it's, it's not about saying, Oh, we shouldn't make games like this or anything like that, but, but, God, there's so much more space out there. Yeah. And that's a very specific fantasy, actually. You know, it's I it's not one that I share. So I talk about violence quite a lot in my work too. And and I really want to make it clear that it's not you know, I love the violence of Bayonetta. You know, that's it's and you know, violence can be really different. Like the violence of Joel in Last of Us is is completely different. Um and I have so much less interest in, I think, that kind of patriarchal dominated violence, but like, Oh, give me some female rage any day. Um, you know, and, and so, uh, and I do think also, you know, there's, there's all of those types of, like, funnily enough, I think lots of people, I know I keep going back to 30 suitors, but that's cause it just came out. So many people have talked to me about how it's actually difficult for them to play thirsty suitors because, it's like too real, emotionally real and, and can feel, you know, so, so there's also an idea of like emotional violence too, you know, just shooting people isn't the only way to, to get all of that. The emotional violence is <laughs> top shelf in Thirsty <laughs> Theaters. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear you say that. I mean, yeah. I think all writers and narrative designers are a little bit sadistic in their souls, you know, like we love, you want to make the player feel something. Um, you know, yeah, I think, and, and a little I think, bit of torture. Yeah. I, I mean, in, in thirsty suitors and we will get to that, but I, mm-hmm. we're just getting into it anyway. Sorry. It's yeah. Free form here. No, it's, <laughs> yeah. I, it's, it's me. The, uh, the emotional and kind of violence through the narrative of the characters is very, I mean, it's like spilling over the edge the whole time it's it's very mm-hmm. there and i think that's a lot i think a lot of video games and characters and writing uh, for characters play it a little too safe mm-hmm. in that area and i feel like um there there has to be that like you have to completely let go because you know in video games with mechanically and animations and characters and everything, mm-hmm. everything has to be much more over the top than yeah. it really should be. And I yeah. think when, when it's not over the top, it's very hard to, to be successful in like communicating emotion there, mm-hmm. except in, I think in the case of like the last of us, which is, mm-hmm. that's, that's a, an example of that I would say of, of, you know, kind of, holding that in and letting it out 
when it needs to come out. Yeah. There's no restraint in Thirsty Suitors. Not at all. It's yeah. extremely maximalist. It's it's almost it's a bit anime in some ways. You know, you have dramatic you highs and bits of sincerity, <laughs> but also there's a kind of surrealness, goofiness. I mean, there's a there's a kind of like magic realism um kind of to it, I yeah. think. Um, all right, let's let's back yeah. up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um um so I first became aware of you as a human uh, on Twitter through mutual friends um, during the pandemic when Mm -hmm. all of the kind of me too um, sexual harassment stuff was coming out specifically around Ubisoft. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just immediately attracted to the way that you were talking about those things because um, you just seemed completely fearless and that was really, um, really good to see and hear about those things. And you've, you continue to be that way since I've, um, started following you and, mm-hmm. um, and that definitely feels like it's in your work too. And I want to, I want to know where you became and how you became, so fearless because it's inspiring uh to see you talk about um the injustice of stuff but also like you know just simply talking about games it comes out when you talk about your work and Mm. i wanted to kind of go go back um actually to your childhood and trying (laughs) to trace this journey of of who you are how you became that way and how you're kind of expertly funneling that into your work today? Wow. Um, I mean, thank you. Um, I'm glad that that kind of comes across. My childhood, I think it probably all really does stem from there. So I I moved around a lot as a child. So I was born in Saudi Arabia. My parents were immigrants there working as doctors. Um, and then we moved to the UK when I was quite young, but I always, you know, I spent time back in India with my, my grandparents quite a bit. So I really did have that dual kind of upbringing. And then when I was about, um, 11, 10 or 11, we moved back to India again. Um, and then another brief stint in Saudi and then back to India until university. So I spent my kind of childhood in the UK and my teenagerhood in, in, in India, but, um, but really, uh, you know, in lots of different, you know, I must have been to about 12 different schools. So we were moving pretty much every year. So you're always meeting people from, from really different cultures. So I think this idea that um, what is normal in any given place and what's kind of desirable um, shifts and changes, you know, depending on where you are. Um, the politics, the laws, the the social norms. And so I think, I, you know, I think that's really the start of, of a lot of the, the political sort of approach, the decolonial approach, and maybe even narrative design as well, because so much of that to me is about being alive to systems and structures and how that then plays out uh, for the, for the kind of individual, the protagonist. Right. Um, uh, and, and, and I think it, I think that's a really helpful mindset to bring into narrative design as well, because in some ways I feel like you're, we're the little outposts of humanities in a very like STEM tech kind of place. Um, and just bringing in an idea that how we build our worlds says something <laughs> politically and otherwise, you know, there's no such thing as a kind of, uh, neutral act of world building. Um, yeah. So I think that, that probably, probably does does come from and and just an interest in people um, yeah. so when 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 did you start being creative like how did that start for you I think I always I always wrote I always wrote like short stories and poetry and my mother still has like embarrassing poetry I wrote at age seven you know and like taped to the fridge uh oh god um you know so I think it's yeah I think writing was always, and and I read a lot. I was a, you know, part of the thing is when you're like moving a lot and you're making new friends and things like that, you, um, you know, obviously the, there was my family and, and that was the consistency, but also like escaping into worlds of fiction um, has just always been something that um, 
that I've done. And then I think as time passed, you know, as uh, you know, I got my first computer at about 11 and I've always been really interested, you know, and, you know, I was there on the early days of the internet, like Usenet and doing play by email games, um, you know, and role playing in, in Yahoo groups and all of that kind of fan early internet stuff, which is, you know, really, really um, beautiful. Um, and I think that interest in like new technology and storytelling, I think I always, I really, I always kind of had, but how I ended up in the games industry is, you know, meandering, uh, and yeah, I have, a, I did a bunch of research and looks like you, you studied at Oxford, mm-hmm. you went to film school yeah, and then the BBC, which to me yeah. in my research looks like that's where it kind of all started taking place. Yeah, actually, um, even before the BBC, I um, interned at Six to Start, which is um, a game studio that used to be run by Adrian Hahn. Um, and they made ARGs back in the day, alternate reality games, so like Perplexity. Um, and I think some of the people worked on I Love Bees. And so, um, you know, yeah. So, I, uh, but then, yeah, the BBC. I worked in. I worked on games, commissioning games um, at the BBC, and most of my job was trying to um, talk to people from television <laughs> about games. And this is in, you know, maybe two thousand nine, two thousand ten, while games still really did not have the kind of cultural dominance and cachet uh, that they do now. Uh, and, you know, and so lots of it was convincing them that it's not just for nerds and, um, and that it was this, this whole, whole separate kind of field and, and, and skill set. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think from there, I mean, I know I'm skipping, skipping the whole realm of my childhood, but, but sort of, I got made redundant at the BBC and then made, made my own game, um, on the story Nexus platform that fall in London and some of the students on this. And some, yes, I'm Sara, yeah. um, which is about dream walking in 18th century Bengal. Um, you know, so really combined, like, you know, my interest in really the reason that I decided to make that game was that I was delving into my own um, history. And uh, it was a process of, of decolonizing myself, really. You know, if you, you know, Interesting. I just, when I went to Oxford, it was really, you know, now I look back and I, I can really see that as part of this need almost to prove myself to empire and to whiteness. And, you know, you want the little check mark from like the citadel, um, of empire, because I think I always, uh, they they're really, I really did feel, um, like a slight, you know, lesser. Uh, and, you know, I think in a way that lots of people who, you know, lots of people who have colonial histories do, um, and it was really, you know, I didn't, I, I, I was really like dismissive of Indian novelists say, and I admired like Camus and Beckett. Uh, and, and, you know, there's, there's, there's all of that, that kind of desire. And, and, uh, it was at Oxford that I I started to think about decolonization in, in some ways, but it was a really long journey in my, in my twenties. And part of that was also, which is a thing that I do quite a lot, you know, making games about things that you're just interested in because I love the research phase of a project and and I loved, you know, so historical research or even social cultural research or, you know, anything like that. But, but in this case, researching. So 1757 was the battle of Palashir, which, you know, arguably is the moment that the British East India company sort of, you know, mercantile colonization of India becomes the British Raj and it becomes a much more government project. Um, and you know, and, and I really wanted to set a game there from the perspective of Indi- of an Indian. Um, uh, it was great for me to like learn about this, but but also toy with this idea of making a, an alternate history. So maybe through player choice, can we avert that that moment of of colonization? Um, I never actually finished it, um, though I released it, it, you know, it's playable. So I think I released several months and it was released in chunks, which I think is a really smart thing because I do think when you're starting to make games, um, it's better to just release something and have people play it rather than wait for kind of perfection. Um, But I didn't finish it because um, Inkle approached me about 80 days. Um, And so I ended up I ended up working on that and, and never never really having time to return after that point. That's a real interesting um, 
point right there, mm. kind of abandoning that game, not abandoning, maybe that's the right mm. word, but um, yeah. to go work on 80 Days, which was awesome mm -hmm. in its own right. Are you ever going to finish the game? I don't. I don't know. I mean, and now Story Nexus has been um, deprecated for for other users, um, but it might it might live on in in some other form. Actually, initially, the idea for the game came out of I was um, plotting a TV show, <laughs> a very ambitious TV show set in both like the present day in 1857 in Bengal and perhaps even the the 16th like the 17th century in um, Tipu's Court in Mysore. Um, you know, so so I think in, in lots of ways, you know, ideas live on. Um, yeah. You know, maybe it'll turn into a novel someday, or or I'll revisit it in some other form. But um, I mean, I think I've got a document that I've had for maybe twenty years. Yeah. With game ideas and stuff's right. always it's all, you're always picking picking stuff out of that. Um, exactly you know. right. Which is it's so I I think I wonder if you feel the same way, Adam, because I think. Um, earlier in my career, I felt so precious about these these ideas, or like you know, um, stressed out if they didn't pan out and if I had to discard something. Whereas as I've I've worked for longer, I I don't. It's very easy to let something go. Maybe it's not the idea for this moment or this project, but it will come back, and if it's relevant, it will return. And there's a kind of peacefulness. Yeah, um, f in games for me, it was very easy to do that. Before I w was making video games, I was a professional musician and yeah. I've been a songwriter for as long as I can remember. And, um, that's where I learned to let go of, of things. Hmm. Cause you know, you, you write, you write a song and it captures a moment in time or a feeling or an event or whatever it is. And, and then you're doing another one and, yeah. and I think that when I got to games, um, I, in the beginning I was precious about stuff and it's like, no, like this idea is like, it's concrete and we're mm -hmm. not going to move on this. And, you know, it, I got over that, um, pretty, pretty early and quickly mm. in my career. But, um, you know, I'm always remixing stuff from, from my document and, yeah. and putting it into into whatever I'm doing now. I mean, you know, the most, the most famous example of, of that is probably like, you know, Paul McCartney, um, you know, with yesterday, yeah. right. You know, the, the famous example of, you know, I wrote that when I was 12 and it used to be called scrambled oh, yeah, eggs. Yeah, yes. Right. So, yeah. you know, if he can do it, we can do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, no, completely. I love, um, I actually really love uh, reading like musician um, biographies or like uh, musicians talking about their their craft as well. I mean, part, as, a, as a writer, I think all writers are secretly envious of musicians, or maybe it's just me. Um, well, it's the other they, way around too. Oh, no. We're, we're jealous of, of writers. I don't see why you would be, because I just think like music is just so visceral. Um, and you don't need words. You don't need language. It can just, it can really speak to people in this, in this, um, really, really deep way. I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm reading Bar Brian Eno's, um, oh, the title's fallen out of my head. The year of thingy it's here on my shelf. Um, oh gosh, no, you know what? Anyway, but, uh, but Doesn't yeah, matter. He's, he's got a few books. They're all great. They're all great. He's so yeah. fascinating, just about the creative process as well. And I do think it's wonderful to hear from people who are in different fields than, than you are, because I think sometimes in games we get really siloed um, or we just take from like the cinematic blockbuster, which is like, I think the least interesting um, yep. medium for us yep. to be looking at. Um, yeah. Have you ever, have you ever checked out Eno's oblique strategies? I haven't. This okay. is my first Eno, yeah. All right. So there's way too much to get into that, <laughs> but like, go check it out. Um, I think you will be super into that. It's, it's essentially, it's a, it's a creative tool. It's a deck of cards hmm. that has like really <laughs> oblique strategies that when you're, you know, when you're creating something, he used it, he used it with Bowie. Um, yeah. Oof. and, um, you basically pick a card, 
and it has like, you know, everything has to be red, like the color red or whatever, you know, yeah. and, and it's about, it's about using those as the creative jumping off points rather than, Oh, I've got this idea that I've been working on. And, yeah. um, he, he did a lot of work with Bowie using those. And I know a lot of people, um, in games kind of look at those too. Anyways, you should check it out. It's really cool. It's, it's, you know, Sounds once you open the, the, uh, the gateway to, Eno, those, <laughs> those come into play. <laughs> Um, oh, I look forward to it. Yeah, it's it's really it's a really fun way to like make what you're doing fresh, and I, I feel love that it. I feel I'm, that there's less of that in games because let's face it, when you make a video game, like you know, when you write a song, you can do that in five minutes. Mm. You cannot make a video game in anything, you know. Let's just say six months for the sake <laughs> six, of conversation. Six months. What a dream that would be. Yeah, yeah I no, mean, a imagine year that. basically is the yeah. yeah. So like, you know, we have these um you know, when you all games kind of start out the same. There's a concept, maybe a document, a prototype, and the desire to do this thing, this mm. idea. And you know, at the end of year three, that thing is never the same. It's never, I've never worked on a game where it's started at and ended at the same thing, the same idea. There's, yeah. there's pieces of it, but yeah. like any good creative work, you, you know, it evolves and people it collaborate you and you go. discover it. Yeah. But mm. it's interesting because games take so long to make, mm. you know, especially like a triple A game. Like, you know, I think the longest I've ever worked on a game was three years and um, that was tough. It was Thirsty really was tough. About three, three and a little bit years actually, which is the longest I've ever worked on on a game, and certainly an indie game. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It's it's tough to to think about an idea at the beginning of year one, and and knowing that oh, this mechanic or this idea or this character is going to resonate in year three when it finally comes out. It's interesting, you know, so I know that we've ended up talking about Thirsty again, but um, because on Thirsty, what we really had was just a long time to let it breathe. So, um, you know, it was a process of discovery with, okay, we had the cooking mechanics and then the animations come in and I kind of got to revisit it um, multiple times and then figure out, oh, right, okay, this is a space for tension and anxiety and there's, there's a paciness to the, to the way the mechanics work. So maybe this needs to be an argument rather than just a conversation. And then to kind of realize, oh, so that's how this fits in. Th these are about emotionally fraught confrontations um, with your parents. Um, you know, because we, we, we really did have that core of like, here are the themes that we want to do, but the plot of Thirsty we reworked pretty much up until, you know, nine months before the end. And, and I kind of rewrote me and, 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 and Nadia, who's the junior writer we brought in, um, in the last year, rewrote every line pretty much in the game, um, or edited it, um, just before we went into voiceover um, and massive sort of changes in like plot and specificity. And I do think, um, that's really helpful because, you know, it, like you were saying, um, it's necessary. It's what you, you know, otherwise it, you just remain in this kind of weird static place of like, you get, have these artifacts of what the game was. And it's only towards the end of a project, actually, to be honest, quite often after you've launched the project that you really figure it out, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I've never worked on a game where I haven't thought, shit, if only I could make it now, um, <laughs> at the end of it, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of the thing in any kind of creative work. It's like, it's, is it ever really done? Yeah. Who's to say, but, yeah. um, yeah. Yeah, you're was, right because actually it if was I went born back into and, the world Yeah. and you know, that's what it is when it is, you know, no, and, you're, you're right. And because actually, if you started actually making it again at the end, knowing everything that you know, it would turn into something else as well yeah. by the time you were finished. So yeah. Yeah. It's almost like the existential crisis of, of creativity and, and making things. It's like, you know, it's exactly what you said. It's like, well, I could totally make this 
different and maybe better and cooler <laughs> now. Yeah. But like you're the only one who's saying it's it needs to be cooler. Yeah. Right. The other the people who are experiencing it as a new thing, they don't think that at all. Nobody thinks that. And how would they? They don't know. They right? haven't seen the shadow of what it what it was intended meant to be in, in some ways. It, I mean, quite interesting though, to to talk about this in terms of you know, our culture of say live service, but even just patching. Um, because so we are currently just, just finished um patching Thirsty for the Steam sale that's upcoming on on the on the twenty first. And it's it's interesting. I've cut some lines, um, you know, and smoothened a few things out. And it's weird because you spend, you know, pretty much the last four months of of working on a game like obsessively playing it and and editing it down but there is and you know and showing it to other people we did loads of user testing and i've shown it we've shown it to so many colleagues and friends but having the having it out into the world and really having people just play it does show you so many things um about it uh you know and and it's been quite interesting to just have a chance to like tweak a few things um but, you know, if you think about, like, say, No Man's Sky, stuff like that, right? Like, so launching is really not the end of a game these days, which is um, good and bad, I think. Well, I'm I'm a little bit older than you and I've mm. uh, been doing, doing it longer, not necessarily better, but just in terms of time. And, you know, we used to, it used to have to go on a disc and that was it. Yeah. And I kind of love that, though. It, yeah, <laughs> I kind of love that, too. Um, mm-hmm. and there were times, <laughs> you know, you'd put, you'd put a game out and then there was no live service. It's yeah. like, Oh, we get a month off now. Like everyone used to get a month off and it was like so important, um, you know, working at places and, and getting like time like that off to like recharge your brain before you kind of jump into the next thing. And I really like, you know, I've never personally worked on a big, huge quadruple A hmm. um, live service game, but I can't. It must be so tough to. It must be rough. I mean, because it's yeah. it's never done. Hmm. It's never done. It's a real commitment, and hats off to all the developers doing that because. You're special. You're built different. <laughs> I mean, and specifically hats off to the people who are doing it, but in a in a mentally and physically healthy way. Because I think you're you're struggling against a, a whole structure that seems to me from the outside to be geared towards like burnout and just taking from you. So I, it must be a lot of work to to be able to do that sustainably. Yeah, and and when I talk to colleagues and friends who work on those games, um, it's interesting because some of them are from a time when, you know, like me, when, when it would, there was a disc and that was the end. And some of them didn't experience that. And the, the differences of, of the, um, excitement and experience of, of being a developer on those things from those two points of views on a game like that are very different. And, Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to someone yesterday about while playing your game, Hmm. Um, about there was like a magic period at the end of the cycle of the PlayStation two, where all these incredible games came out and it was like developers had learned how to use the machine. Hmm. And, um, we were at a really interesting flexion point of like games evolving, how they looked and how they played, Hmm. um, in a really interesting and rapid way. And a lot of that had to do with the technical limitations of the PlayStation two and the other consoles at the time, or were there, I can't remember if the Xbox was out by then or not. I'm too old. Um, Oh, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Anyways, there were other consoles obviously, but, um, Oh, I don't know. Actually, I'm thinking about it because I was like, I, I remember being envious of my friend's PlayStation, but I that was when I had my SNES. So I'm not yeah. sure if the Xbox Yeah, I mean, that, obviously, yeah. Nintendo was in the game. No mm. pun intended. Um, mm. But anyways, there there was a technical limitation of, of the hardware. 
yeah. versus the ambition of developers mm. plus it goes on a disc when it comes out yeah. and the games at the end of that cycle all benefited from those like stop gaps limitations mm -hmm. and this is it is what it is and it's interesting to think about those type of games versus the games that we're talking about right now these big kind of giant live service games because it just it doesn't end right well so this is in some ways like my my critique of the colonialist capitalist framework of, of video games also goes into this which is this need for everything now to be endless <laughs> you know endless procedural generation for games to just take up your time like do you really need how many games do we actually need that could can be played infinitely we are all mortal, you know, on, in this world. Um, and I do think there's that, that attention hungriness, uh, right, which I don't think is, is, is great for, I don't think it's great for the medium. I don't think it's great for developers. I think it's, you know, the long, you know, having these development cycles as well increasing um, can be really heartbreaking too uh, for some of the reasons that you mentioned, but also because things get canceled, Um you know, and I have so many friends and colleagues who have been in the industry for like 10, 15 years and like either have one thing or nothing to kind of show for it because they've spent two or three years like working on projects that have just like been canned and there's one six year project. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm less of a, I'm less of a fan of this in infinitude. And I do also think limitation is very creatively stimulating and and um and exciting <laughs> yeah and you know there's there's nothing inherently wrong with a game being a platform and going forever but i do agree with your statement that how many do we need mm -hmm. right because i think you know when you're a game developer, you're obsessively buying other games and constantly playing them. And mm -hmm. like you buy a lot of games, you get a lot of games. It's not hard to get games when you're a game developer is what yeah. I'm saying. And you, you know, you want to be current, you play as much as you can. And I think it's, it's, there's pro there's a real disconnect I think between what, how a developer <laughs> plays games and, and a consumer because, you know, it's 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 always interesting year after year to hear people discover that most people only buy like three or four games a year. It's four games. So Steam literally did their end of year thing, and it's been really interesting to see, like you know, Twitter be like, oh "My God, the average gamer only plays four games a year." Yeah, we're outliers, and all of the journalists they're all outliers too, and all of the people commenting on Reddit that we think of as our audience, these are you know, if you're playing. If you're playing any more than four games in a year, which all of us are, you know, it's so it, I think it's such an interesting and important thing for us to remember um, when it comes to our players as well. But also, you know, I think this also goes to to another thing. So someone was was talking about how they were looking at all of the indie games that have been nominated for the Game Awards. I mean, we have a critique of the Game Awards. That's not yes, we do. Um, but they were saying most of those indie games have less than 200 reviews on Steam. Yeah. You know, which is kind of shocking, and even 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 thirsty. You know, thirsty's done uh, done really well, and it's done really well critically. But you know, it's perhaps sold um, a little bit less than we would we would like. I think you know it might might pick up in the in the kind of long term. But I think it's that's also an industry wide thing. Um, you know, in a in a year stuff full of like big AAA releases. If people are playing four games a year, I mean, freaking hell, if you play Baldur's Gate, that's 70 hours <laughs> If you for one playthrough. Um, how much time and also how much money do you have, you know? Well, and, and yeah. I, I do mean, also think the cost of living crisis is global. Like people just don't have disposable income in the same way. Yeah. And um, I think that it's pretty obvious what we're seeing all over right mm -hmm. now is that these big, huge live service games are, they're not, it's not satisfying for everyone any, every more like mm -hmm. game developers are exhausted. <laughs> you know, 
the the people funding them are exhausted. The players are exhausted. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that, you know, it's all going to come crashing down, but like we are definitely at an inflection point where um, business wise, player wise and development wise for these big live service games, it's not all syncing up like it's like it's intended to. And, yeah. you know, it's not that difficult to look back a few years and see how many people were playing Facebook games yeah. and how that doesn't even exist anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And, you know, everything is, is cyclical in, yeah. in this industry. Um, and it's very interesting to see, you know, consumers revolting mm-hmm. against it, developers kind of revolting against it. And it's like, where does it, you know, what is the future of these things? Which is an entirely different podcast that, that we shouldn't, um, <laughs> uh, that we shouldn't get into today because we actually do have to really <laughs> dive into thirsty suitors. And I think this is probably the time to do it. Exactly. Or we could just discuss the future of the games industry for the next hour. Probably. I know. Well, <laughs> give the people but. what they want. Um, so Yeah. Obviously, we've talked a little bit about it and we've mm-hmm. gone gone back and forth. There's a lot here, but um, I enjoyed this game so much um, for a ton of reasons. And it's hard to even like I have a I'm looking at a huge document of research and notes that oh I've made. Gosh. I'm excited. Uh, which I do for these, but we'll never get to all of it. Yeah. There's no possible way. <laughs> so. I will just say that um, this game was really surprising and touching emotionally for me um, and fun and um, unique and interesting. I've obviously been aware of the game for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Fan of Outer Loop, fan of Echo. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, obviously great seeing you guys uh, working with Annapurna on this. Yeah. So before we like dive into it it's like um it was just (laughs) well i mean i actually have a quote from you okay (laughs) this is interesting okay this is you Mm -hmm. i keep joking with my friends whenever i'm explaining this to non-gamers i'm like all right the power fantasy of thirsty suitors is to get to speak up to your parents tell them how you feel and they listen and learn and grow and the final boss is your maternal grandmother. It's about the fantasy of breaking cycles of generational trauma, which is very real, very human. And yes, they're very specific, but I think these are really universal ideas. So mm-hmm. that's you explaining the game to people who are supposedly non, non-gamers, non but it works. <laughs> yeah. Is that how you would explain this game? Is that like a pretty pretty good summation of it because i've seen you explain it a bunch of different ways but this (laughs) is the one that stood out and yeah i think also um um that bronze girl on a stream called it a horny hot brown girl simulator (laughs) which i also love (laughs) um yeah i I think i i uh i (laughs) the the (laughs) things that i've heard this game called let me get my list out the a uh, yakuza like mashup, breakup mm-hmm. simulator, yeah, horny That's dating RPG, yeah. <laughs> and my favorite, the horniest game of all time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, surely not. There's there's so, there's some erogi on Steam that I'm sure gives us probably yeah the, the horniest one without at an least, eighteen. <laughs> yeah, at, at least that um that are legal to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it, that was really, it's a really interesting, um, summary of it. I find that your quote there is pretty accurate. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to tell you how, what my experience was with it. Yeah. Um, so first of all, um, I grew up in a small, um, rural town in Connecticut yeah. and my parents were professors at the university of Connecticut and there were many, um, South Asian families Mm -hmm. in my neighborhood. Yeah. And I grew up 
in a very multicultural, you know, New England college town. Right. And I spent a lot of time in households yeah. that were portrayed, the same household that was portrayed in your game. <laughs> Oh, and it wow. was it was shocking to me how authentic it was from my experience obviously oh my i can't say it's authentic because i you know i'm not south asian i you know but the the characters and the home life and the way they mm-hmm. interact with each other with this like super warmth but also insane um, like, um, expectations and, and, you know, like I, I saw that a lot growing up. I spent a lot of time in those houses. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of, um, a lot of friends who I hung out with regularly and I was not ready for that. It, (laughs) it was like a very, um, I got very emotional playing that game a couple times and it was really, what I love about that is like, that's what games are supposed to do. Mm. Right. And we don't get that a lot. So yeah. bravo for making something really authentic. But also I think you succeeded because it got to me. Yeah. Right. I love that. I don't necessarily think it was made for me, but mm-hmm. it was made for me to experience it. Yeah whatever that experience was. And because of my experience growing up in the eighties yeah, around those, those families, those characters were like, like taking me back. <laughs> I love this. You I know, love- I am, um, especially the dad. I mean, this He's guy, the breakout fave. <laughs> yeah, man, this guy, he, he was the heart and the soul of the game for me. Because I've seen so many people like that. Like, yeah. I, I'm not saying it's stereotypical at all. It's just very like, so on the, on the, you know, nail on the head of, yeah. of that. So, you know, and it, I really loved the, my absolute favorite part of the whole game was everything that revolved at, at the house. Like, yeah. I just wanted to always go, go back ahead. to the house to check in the refrigerator at night, <laughs> those conversations with dad. Yeah. Finally, like, um, being completely exhausted at the end of the day of mm-hmm. fighting your exes, <laughs> fighting your hot, yeah, toxic exes, fighting your hot, toxic exes, <laughs> and then just like collapsing into your dad. And yeah. then he takes you to bed. Like he carries you up, carries you back. up the stairs. Right. Yeah. And, and you're that, in your mid twenties, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. And that really continues through the whole game in a bunch of different ways. Like mm. the other thing that I found really emotional, which is super weird. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it, like the way your dad, the way he's there for her yeah. when she fails a battle yeah. and he lifts her yeah. up. Literally. Like, holy shit, that was so cool. It was really yeah. like... It's like one line of a little pep talk or, you know, some little silly comment and it's like, go back up there, you know? But, but the physical act of yeah. bringing her back up there is like, that's parenting. <laughs> you know? You know, there's parents on it because, you know, it has a parent and... um we have parents on the team too, so it's, it, was, it was so nice in a way because you're like, yes, it's from the perspective of the of the child, but also we're all, you know, I'm in my mid thirties, you know, so there's a certain amount of like looking back, like Jala's younger than I am, um, so it's not, you know, so there, there's a kind of, uh, you know, I think, and you want to experience a little bit of that to tell the story, being able to see the perspective of the parents too, even though you're inside kind of Jala's. Um, Jala's head but I think I think it's it's interesting you know you really I really see that there's people are so hungry for um for like warm dads <laughs> in in games and to kind of inhabit that right and, and for us as well uh, there's this desire to like portray brown men as like soft and warm um in a very real way um the dad is is kind of really drawn from Eka's dad who's a very like gentle um, loving, you know, figure in his life. I mean, obviously it's not, it's not one-to-one. We pull from loads of different, um, 
different sources. You know, my, my father too, he's very different, um, as a person, like more, like, but you know, a very like, kind of, I think a little bit of an alpha male outside of the house, but very like gentle in, in, in the home. Yeah. Um, just very, mm. really like a very authentic portrayal of, of that kind of person, which I, like I said, I, I've, I've experienced that. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I felt very seen with, with the, the Cold War documentary. <laughs> uh, you know? That's, I mean, that's, that's definitely my dad a little bit, but another little thing that's very lovely is that, you know, um, dad talks about watching Jala's old basketball games yep. and the, the audio for that is, is from Aka's recordings of basketball games with his son. Um, that's so you know, cool. so there's, there's all of this like little, little pieces of, of, of truth there. And I think in the game as well, you know, because Jala is being confronted at every turn with all of her past mistakes and, you know, her mother is, they're, they're very loving. They, in fact, they're very similar. And so they kind of crap clash. And so there's a much more, there's a lot more tension in the relationship with her mom, which also plays out through cooking. And so like cooking with dad is, is a little bit of a break from that. And, um, and, and then all of the other exes as well, right? Everyone wants to confront Jala with, how she's messed up. And then you have dad who's just there as this, um, this encouraging figure who's just like on her side. Um, and I do think you need that because I think, you know, then you also got the narrator as the inner voice, who's like a manifestation of your negative self-talk. And the whole times though, the whole time though, dad's taking shots from everybody. And he's (laughs) actually this, the like emotional center in the rock of, of this thing. Right. Like, you know, Mom saying stuff. Grandma's definitely saying stuff. It's grand. You know, <laughs> you know. But like you mentioned, like the the what the cooking part was mm-hmm. so cool because the 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 um the back and forth counterplay between mm-hmm. like actually making a recipe and, and yeah. making a dish and like also digging into your relationship at the same mm-hmm. time and like you know. And the choices that you have narratively to mm-hmm. respond to those things yeah. um, were very well done. Like, um, I found myself not skipping uh, a mm-hmm. lot where, you know, a lot of times in RPGs, it's like, of course, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But I was really, like, really interested to see how they all played together. And I think there's a very, it's a really well done kind of intertwining of the systems of gameplay between the combat and the skateboarding, the cooking, but also how they're all those drive narrative. And then mm-hmm. the narrative always drives those things mm-hmm. in a really um, very tight and meaningful way that I thought was really well done. And I think you, you miss those kind of things in much bigger mm. RPGs. So I think the fact that it was, Contained. Smaller and contained, those things really shined. Like, you know, the journey of making a dish mm-hmm. and having that experience and and how that dish and the person you had the experience with mm-hmm. plays out in combat yeah. is very cool, very unique. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about um, how you did that because it was great. I mean, I think it's, re- it's really that we there's so much time to percolate on these things and like as the mechanics developed we could kind of um figure out what type of story needed to happen um i think for cooking the big the big revelation was about pace because you know azo we have one animator on the team which you know i have to say because if, if you play the game it's so, like there's so that's much that's impossible that, there's it's no way wild. that's true that's he's not true he's a maniac he's a one ma- person? I mean, in the best way one person and he does every single one of those tricks himself. So I think part of the reason they're skating in the game is because Azo skates. But like everything, including like all of Jala like flinging off her shirt and stuff like all of that, there's vid- like side by side video of Azo doing every one of those things that he uses as an animation reference. That's remarkable. 
wild, right? Um, but so Azo like really started adding all of this uh, very like wuja um, over the top like martial artsy animations to very simple cooking actions like lighting the stove is a huge production like flipping a pat like she's like you know uh, kind of parkouring off the walls and things yeah it's great so so you know i mean so i think that in combination with you know this idea of in a very real way quite often in asian families and i think in lots of immigrant households the way in which you get to talk to your parents is when you're doing a shared activity together it's like when you're when you're you're brought together in this space and time and, and almost like in a very cinematic way, right? Like you're doing something with your hands and that almost allows you to be emotionally a bit more free. <clears throat> so you kind of have that human, that human idea was really what, what shaped our approach to cooking. But then because of the paciness and the over the topness of this, I realized, um, you know, you, you really, you really want, um, the, the choices to like, to not really linger for it to, for it to feel really pacey and to kind of use the, use the idea, especially with mum of like going back to the cooking as a way of avoiding conversation. So it's like, just as you get to like an emotional resonant moment or you push something, she's like, Oh, stir the rice, you know? Yeah. Um, like this may be TMI, but like yeah. we all have our families, everyone, <laughs> they're all different. Yeah. <laughs> and and this may be TMI for all of our listeners too, but like I found myself getting really emotional during those moments because I didn't really have those, that kind of family mm. growing up. My family is fine. It's nothing bad, mm. but it's just like, there was like stuff there that I was like, it made me realize I was like almost aching for that in yeah. my past life, but proud of myself because I'm giving that to my yeah. the family that I've created now. Yeah. And it was very emotional. Like, like I was obsessed with, with, um, getting approval in during the cooking <laughs> games. Right. That was real mm. and terrifying for me. And I I'm think that's really interesting because mm. when you're, when you're putting mechanics to mm -hmm. characters and, and narrative like that, in a video game, usually it's about saving the world. Yes. Right. And the most boring task in my, yeah. View. Yeah. But like, there's so much more, um, tension and like weight in, you know, I don't want to disappoint my, my family. Yeah. I mean, right? I think that, that's something so relate, so much more relatable and oh, <laughs> emotionally universal. fraught. Yeah. And, and that, I think the smallness of the stakes in this game are what I'm really proud of. And, and, and you realize that they're not small. Am I going to be able I to- I have to disagree with you. They're yeah, not small. They're not small, right? <laughs> they're not small. I mean, small. In, the, in the sense of compared to saving the world, but it's not small to, am I going to be able to mend my relationship with my sister? Am I going to gain my mother's approval? Um, am I going to be able to um, make friends with someone that I really hurt, but who I love? Um, and can I make up for having hurt them? You know, these are- I think these are very, uh, they're very real and, um, and there's so much, there's so much dramatic kind of space in that. The approval thing is the, you know, it's also like for me, um, one of my friends pointed out like, Oh, really appreciate how you've taken all of your, you know, issues with your mother and put them, you know, put them into co cooking. So cooking is the one thing my mom is going to kill me when I talk about this, but she, my mother is an amazing cook. <clears throat> And she's a wonderful, very loving, very supportive person. But it's the one arena in which I think I feel like I can never live up to her. And, you know, cooking is also standing for like certain types of Indian femininity. I, I have nightmares about her dying before she teaches me certain recipes that I love. <laughs> um, but, her, you know, even though she's really encouraging, I feel a lot of judgment from her. And, you know, th there'll be times where if we're making things in the kitchen together, she'll just take like a, the spoon from out of my hand and do it properly, you know? And, and like, and it, it I, I'm so fraught about it and I realize I'm bringing so much of it. So I think, I think that's what's really nice about, I think that's why the cooking works. Cause there's a real emotional heart and truth, uh, to the idea of filling up <laughs> the approval meter. Um, 
And that also meant that we, I got to write these very different responses, like, you know, because we have feedback on each step. And mom is so reluctant to praise you. And the moment she even gives you some praise, she wants to, like, you know, dial it back or puncture your ego. Um, yeah, I love I all the stuff where she's like, <laughs> that was really good if you were doing it for your dad, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Oh, I think at the end, if you do really well on one of the dishes, she's like, oh, I'd serve this to guess. Not desi guess, but you know. oh, wow. yeah. um, but whereas dad is just like, wow, Jala, you should be a professional chef. You're amazing. Um, which in some ways though is less it's less realistic. Like for me, my dad is a bit like that. And I always prefer my mum's critique in some ways, because that feels more respectful to me. And I feel like you you learn more. Um, but it's an it's an interesting just going back to what you were saying earlier as well, um, Adam, I think this is also something really interesting about the power fantasy and the the fantasy of, of, of thirsty, I think, is that it's a it's a fantasy of an accepting family for like queer South Asian kids or like a, a you know, a, a warm, fundamentally loving but imperfect family for people who have for people who have that, it's seeing themselves represented. But for people who maybe don't, it's the fantasy of getting to have one and to come and live in a world where your dad is really gentle if you didn't have a gentle dad, or you do make meals together if that's something you didn't do. Um, and so I think it's it's important to remember, like, it can be representation to someone and a fantasy to someone um, at the same time, you know? Well, I mean, I had all those experiences, you know? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I mean, you know, it's, it's slightly emotional just talking about it with you because... Yeah. Um, that's that's what I love about games, right? Yeah. When it when they make you feel something, and it's so hard to make a game that makes anyone feel anything, you know. I look, think. I mean, when you make games, like I ebb and ebb and flow with games. Hmm. There's, I'm just coming out of a period where I'm not mm -hmm. playing any games. Hmm. I don't want to look at games. I don't want yeah. anything to do with games. Um. I'm playing this time of the year. I play more games than than any mm -hmm. any <clears throat> any because of my commitments to what we're doing here and um, in the uh, the Dice Awards panels. I'm on mm -hmm. a couple panels that, including the narrative one, which by the way you should be on. You should be on next year. Um, oh well, you know we'll we'll get that going. That. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and like you have to play a lot of games and you know, there's like sometimes a hundred games you get yeah. for like nominations and stuff. It's hard not to get feel jaded. Well, that's the thing. It, it, it's not hard. It's easy to get <laughs> yeah. jaded. Yeah. And, um, you know, any game that gets made is a miracle and yeah. everyone should be supported by that. And there's no bad games in my opinion. There's mm -hmm. just, games that don't resonate with some people and that's the yeah. way it is, but they might resonate with someone else. Mm -hmm. um, but playing this game actually got me excited about games again. Like I'm playing through a bunch of games, but like mm -hmm. it was just like the shot in the arm that I needed yeah. to like, remember why we do this and kind of take me, take me out of the, the doldrums of like slogging through some games that I, that I, you know, a game that I might not necessarily play. Um, personally, but I'm playing yeah. it, um, to, you know, to assess it for yeah. awards and things like that. So, well, thank you. It, that's a, that's an enormous compliment. Um, well, but I think that like, you know, this is what makes Annapurna so special, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, that's always, always the case. And they're the games that they put out and publish you know, they have that quality. And also you can finish them in in two days or whatever. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Right? I you know? six, six to nine hours. I talk, really, talk I with those guys about this all the time. Hmm. Um, you know, the concept of the 15 minute game. We'll get there. <sighs> oh, uh, okay. But yeah, no, and Annapurna, you know, gave us complete creative freedom um, and never came yeah. back and said, oh, make it a bit less queer. Oh, make it a bit less brown. You know, because it's, it's really, it's kind of, it's a little edgy in, 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 in all of this. It's very unapologetic um, about where it stands. And, and I think there could be many funders who may feel a little nervous 
about it. Yeah, but, it's, oh. it's cream of the crop over there, right? <laughs> you, it's 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 where a game like this should be. Everything yeah. everything went the right way with that. Yeah. Um, okay, so I wrote down a list of right, what I it. thought the themes, the mm-hmm. themes that came out to me. Yeah. Um, joy. Yeah. Being your authentic self, South yeah. Asian, queer, a woman. Yeah. Yeah, a woman. <laughs> Acceptance. Yeah. Obviously relationships, familial, romantic, mm-hmm. and also geographic, which mm. is a huge important thing that mm. I think um, we should at least touch on. Mm-hmm. And rebuilding connections mm. and honesty. Those were like the mm. themes uh, that came out in the game for me. Am I off base? No, I think Did that's I nail it. Think- I think you, I think you, I think you've entirely nailed it. I think, uh, you know, we all really wanted it to feel joyful, but not in this, not in a twee way, you know. And and you know, I I love many of my friends are making wholesome games. It's a label, all of these things. But personally, I'm less keen on the idea of like wholesomeness, even though arguably you could kind of describe Dusty. It's, it's quite, I feel it is quite wholesome, um, but it's not twee, um, and I hope it still deals with, you know, difficult. It's it's not a safe emotional place, actually, even though, actually, no, what it is, we really wanted to build this world where you felt safe being triggered and having these emotions and having these difficult conversations. Um, And I think it's, yeah, I think a lot of it is maybe about like facing yourself in all of these ways, you know, and, and uh, having all of these other people, I think especially past relationships as well, they see a version of you and it's not necessarily the full version. I think with all of her exes as well, you know, someone was saying to me, oh, I felt like actually, um, you know, the other, your, her, Jala's exes got left off the hook a little bit <clears throat> in this game, Agreed. you know, and Jala got, was apologizing for a lot more. And I was like, yeah, I think arguably so, but you know, you're playing her and this is her journey of, of kind of taking accountability and, you know, and, and, uh, but I hope it does come across that, you know, both, both parties made mistakes, right? It's not one person fucked up. You, you did it together. Um, <clears throat> but in some ways I think, you know, she sees herself through each of these relationships and she, she kind of has to grow from that. And I think part of that is, is letting, letting it be hard for her and, be kind of painful for, but I think it really builds up. I'm really curious about what you thought about the, the, the narrator, the moment you say goodbye to the narrator. Yeah. Um, that was, I did not see that coming and it was really cool. Oh, great. You didn't. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, yeah, it was really, really interesting. The swap that was made there and Mm it, see if I can articulate this correctly Mm -hmm. or properly or so that at least makes fucking sense. (laughs) <laughs> it came at a time where she changed yeah. massively as a person and using the narrator swap there um elevated that in a really nice way um that i i really appreciated and i was almost like you kind of like oh i started like future tripping about what what happens after the game, you know, with, yeah. with that, with that thing. So that was really cool. Um, it was very, um, very in tune with, you know, the themes mm-hmm. of that we talked about. I, I'm sure there's many more, but those, that, those are the ones that came to the top for me. But like this journey that she goes on of mm-hmm. like redemption and repair yeah. Yeah. was, was very, um, like I got a lot out of that. I'll just leave it at that. Mm. Um, we were making it during, we started working on this pretty much like a month or so before lockdown one as well. So I think there's something, there's something. Did you say that. lockdown one? Yeah. Lockdown one. <laughs> that is so dark. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Here I get are. it, but man, that's dark. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to the new normal. Yeah. Um, where we're all hideously unwell all the time, which is great. Love it for us yeah. as a species. Um, but you know, but I think I think all of these things that you're talking about, this feeling of like connection, it was such a it was such a joyful world for us to be in. There's this feeling that 
it was really great to feel it. And so Outer Loop is also a fully remote team and we're scattered kind of throughout the globe, yep. um, which in some ways meant it was really easy for us to like transition into into the pandemic. But there is that feeling of disconnection we're all feeling. There is this this feeling of reset, of reevaluation of, of life. Um, on a personal level as well, I, 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 I split up with my my partner of like 14 years <laughs> around that time as well. Um, so in, I wasn't, we didn't set out intentionally to like make a great game about like. Well, that definitely know. didn't show up in the game at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, you know, and I was like, maybe this is a little too on the nose to like process my feelings through making art like so deeply there were moments where i would write a scene for thirsty and be like oh okay no that's for therapy i'm gonna put that in the therapy folder and yeah. uh, we'll, we'll return to this after we've done a bit more healing because i do think it's not helpful to write fully from a place of um of trauma um and uh, i've gotten burned trauma. by that in in a couple of games that i've made yeah. writing that way yeah um i probably Maybe. wouldn't do that again yeah, I think that's for the that's for the journal, you know, and and I think I think it really helped that Jala was in her early twenties as well. So you know, there's this sense of like looking looking back um, with some of the insights that you have now. But it was really it was a very transitional period for me as well, and a real re you know, also kind of going back to uh, how we began this. There was also you know all of this the Me Too stuff was happening in the games industry. There's a lot of activism. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of pain uh, and reckoning. I think, uh, yes. you know, BLM was also happening around that uh, around that time, and so it felt like a big social cultural reckoning. Um, and I think a lot of that that kind of energy and approach really went went into this. So you really want that sense of like of um, in a in a very good way. Sometimes the shattering of trauma can be an opportunity for for real, like for, for growth, you know, I mean, we talk about like post-traumatic healing, et cetera, but, but to be able to like, look at your life and see, see it in pieces and then be able to rebuild again and only take what serves you and discard kind of what doesn't. Um, and I think I was experiencing that at that point. And so Jala does mirror that in some ways, even though in, in, you know, really, um, in, in, there was artistic transformation. It wasn't, you know, entirely so. But at the same time, it was so nice for me to spend time in this world of Timber Hills um, in during the pandemic and in this sense of dislocation and to spend time in a joyful place. And not just joyful, but not, not nihilistic and not mean-spirited. And I think quite often, you know, in, in games, there's this feeling of... Um, that's the that's the only things things of serious artistic merit are grim, and are hopeless, um, you know, and are cynical. I hate um, that. I absolutely and I hate, hate it. that. Me too. It's really. I hate that. It's like, you know, this may be simplifying what you're talking about, mm. but like, like when did that happen? Because like mm. when you go back to like Pac Man. Mm -hmm. Donkey Kong, like all the, all the classic arcade games. It's like, that was just like pure joy with like a simple sentence of this is your entire narrative. It's like, you know, the yeah. simple, a simple thing. And like, you know, in my opinion, what we're talking about right now is like, that's the game industry um, trying to be like Hollywood. Exactly. Right? I think it's, it's that it's a insecurity about the kind of, you know, artistic well, value. And I want to scream this from the roof. I've been saying this for decades, mm -hmm. but like if you're aping Hollywood, why is why? it just that? Yeah. Like, yeah. Let, like have you Hollywood. ever seen a comedy at, before? <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. Right. Like what about a rom-com? And I actually think in some ways thirsty is very, it's quite rom com -y in a totally. like sort of nineties way. Right. Like in the, like, and like, if you watch Harry Met Sally, it's such a, I mean, it's a great piece of filmmaking. Oh, I mean, it's one of the, one of the greats for sure. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, one that you can go back to and it's, it's still as meaningful today as it was back yeah. then, because once again, they're talking about universal truths yeah. and universal things that, that people go through. But like, you know, I mean, I get it. Like a gun is a fun way to interact with the world. It's fun. Mm. I love 
shooty games. Well, but we've made, made it, we've made it yeah. fun as well, yeah. you know, because that's what our job is. We make it fun. And I think we could make other things fun. <laughs> yeah. Too. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully people see this game and, and, uh, and take something, take that from it because, and, you know, in the indie space, there's tons of games doing stuff yeah. like this. Right. And that's, yes. that's where it happens. And that's also a very like one-to-one parallel with movies. Right. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. And I think we should be looking at Hollywood and the marvelization of everything and the squeezing of space oh. for independent movies with fear and trepidation rather than, you know, let's, let's imitate them more because, you, you know, I think you see the, the necessity for like the indie space and the, like the double A as we would maybe call it here, you know, um, uh, to kind of, and non-commercial work to, to really thrive because that is what renews, um, the industry creatively. Yeah, and I I think we're actually seeing a a lot of that. <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of that right now. I think there's 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 fantastic games in the indie space, obviously yeah. that yeah. are, um, you know, doing or not doing what the games not in the indie space are doing. Absolutely, um, though the fund, you know, we're experiencing such a funding squeeze. You know, so many of my my friends and colleagues in the indie space are just really struggling to get things funded at the moment, and there's a lot of risk aversion because um, of interest rates. Money is just more expensive at the moment. So I do, you know, I, I that that like concerns me a little bit, you know, because I, I mean I, that concerns me a lot because yeah. because um, again, oversimplifying it just for the sake of getting through it but when there's risk aversion Hmm. that's when where creativity takes a hit and when there's risk aversion that's also where um bringing new voices up takes Mm -hmm. a hit and the whole cycle is kind of like built upon money yeah you know and it look it is the video game industry. Mm-hmm. It's the video game business. We're creating mm-hmm. entertainment for dollars. Yep. And and when you do that, you can either not have a message and not touch people, or you can and <laughs> do that. And and what we're talking about right now is like, I mean, it's just like the game industry is following Hollywood in parallel mm-hmm. in every in every sense of the form, this already happened in Hollywood. Yeah. 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 Right? Exactly. Right. It, 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 that, that should be, the, you know, we should be like, Oh, let's not go there. It's <laughs> a freaking dark avoid. specter, like hang over thing. And you think about yeah. like the, the absolute um, horror show of mm-hmm. what's happened with game developers this yeah. year is like, you know, maybe it's, maybe I'm just, pessimist in some ways i'm i'm probably in the middle but like Mm. if you can't see that in the coming year Mm. there's going to be less jobs and the ones that are available are going to pay less than they did before yeah like we are gonna lose a generation of knowledge and Mm. expertise because people aren't gonna stay yeah right they're either going to be forced to not stay or they're going to say, fuck this. I deserve I can get more. Paid 10 times more at a tech company. Right. And mm-hmm. the generational, like an institutional knowledge that we're about to lose and maybe already have, honestly, yeah. is a huge problem for the industry. And, you know, I actually did a thread about this on, mm-hmm. I don't even remember what one of the, one of the many layoffs. It might be, might have been Blue Sky. I deleted right. it right after because right. I should know better about tweeting after <laughs> at this point in my life. <laughs> um, but it was like, you know, like people need to see this. Hmm. Like they need to see that the consolidation of everything yeah. is super dangerous. And yeah. we're only consolidating right now because people went over the top. Mm-hmm. During the pandemic, mm-hmm. and also what you spoke about, money is more expensive now. Mm-hmm. Like the, these things that are happening in the game industry right now are they're never like the game industry is changed forever this year. Yeah. Like all of these 
um, everyone who's been laid off, yeah. like they're going to hold that forever, right? Yeah. No one's going to feel safe yeah. at a job anymore. I mean, that already existed, but it's been, it's been amplified by. But if, if at Epic, you can't be secure in your job at Epic, like Fortnite, are you kidding? I mean, I think that that's the thing that I'm really seeing. And, and I feel like there's a lot of legitimate anger about like, we are making shitloads of money for people in the games industry. And yet somehow we're still so precarious and, you know, the execs keep their multi-million dollar bonuses after having made, you know, I think so much of it is also investing in like metaverse and, and all of these gambles that didn't pay off, but they, they make the mistakes and who ends up paying for it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite, it's quite an indictment of the industry to, to kind of sit back and look at it right now and see everything that's going on. I mean, it is the 20th of December. We are not yeah. done with layoff announcements. Which is horrific, you know, you know, to lay people off at, towards the end of the year like this, when you know that this is not a time where hiring happens, is just, uh, I mean, it's inhumane, <laughs> I think, really. Well, all that being said, mm -hmm. um, going back to Thirsty Suitors, when I was saying that it, yeah. it made me feel good about games again, and, yeah. you know, it's it's like games like this are very like important to just the health of of the industry for you know a bunch of different ways um and it's just so amazing that it exists and i wanted to before we finish say a couple more things because we didn't talk about uncle hinty yet but we need to talk <laughs> about uncle hinty <laughs> Because wow, runaway like, fan favorite. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like voiced like, by Aka, the creative director. Yeah, I mean, it's like <laughs> that's like magic right there. That's like <laughs> I think we added him like towards the end because we needed like another hint because the narrator occasionally breaks the fourth wall and gives you a few hints, but like, yeah. You know. <laughs> so is he actually part of the family? No, he's like the, he's an uncle who's like a, in a very Indian way, like unrelated, unrelated but uncle. somehow shows up at every yeah. family gathering and no one like who the, yeah. I've got one of there. those. Yeah. <laughs> um, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really, really like just so awesome when he shows up, it's always like at the right time and just like this pop of him. And then the last thing I wanted to say was <clears throat> at the very end of my play session, mm -hmm. I can't remember where exactly it was. You'll know. Mm -hmm. um, the <laughs> At the end when dad pops out and does the chow yun fat uh, thumbs up meme. Like, yeah. first of all, that's like, I use that thing every day. <laughs> I use that meme every day. It's my favorite thing. Oh, and the the guttural hilarious laugh that came out of me actually startled my wife and she had to come in from another room and ask me if I was okay. Oh, like amazing. that was just like such a fun way to like wrap it up um, for me. The, so, so the context of this is it's at the end of the grandma battle. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really the huge climactic moment of the game. So you, you start out with a kind of cooking session um, where you're making something for grandma. And basically the argument between you, your mom, your sister, who you've just reconciled with and things are still a little fraught. And, and you know, your grandma who makes your mom incredibly like nervous and anxious. Um it, it, it escalates and ex escalates to the point that the argument becomes so big that the entire house explodes, um, which I just love is this kind of visual metaphor, right? Like the entire domestic scene is, explodes. And then you have this like skating section. So we pull in all of, all of the different mechanics that you've been playing with. So it's, it's just very narratively mechanically satisfying, I think. Very um, sound, and, very and sound. And you have all of this, like this big skating section, and then you have a, a gigantic, emotionally devastating battle with your grandma, which really ends with her kind of taking a step back and going, oh, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'm not too old to learn after also guilt tripping you. Um, yeah, but, then, but then there's, there's, it ends in a big hug. So all of the battles in Thirsty on the defeat is a reconciliation. You yep. know, these, is, these aren't about humiliating your opponent. It's, it's about healing. And so you have Jala hugging her grandma, her mom hugging her. 
like we also do this interesting thing where you know generally there's the summon with mom is she's she's a gigantic creature with a huge chuckle like a slipper and she comes and smacks down your opponent and when you summon your mom in this battle she like throws away the chuckle instead and instead hugs her mom and then Arani, your sister comes in and so it's like this big all of the women in the family all these three generations hugging and then dad just popping in from the side just to you know give you a big thumbs up like well done like i'm not gonna intrude on this moment this is for you guys but also eating I've food here. he's eating food yeah <laughs> <laughs> he's just been snacking in the corner yeah. while this world ending argument has been ha- he knew he'd need the energy to like you know pick up the pieces of whoever was left yeah i went from like like <laughs> almost tearing up to laughing out loud so hard yeah. in that in that moment it was it was such an awesome awesome way to end the game and i feel like you know i feel like we didn't really talk too much about um the whole end battle with grandma, mm-hmm. but I'll, I'll tell our listeners, wait till you see it. It's <laughs> something else. And it, you know, th- we could do a whole podcast on that too, but yeah. you know, it was, <clears throat> it was such a treat playing the game. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, it was so, I mean, it was kind of like Barbie in a way i just like needed I it that comparison. you know i loved bobby yeah. just like needed that blast of of color and mm-hmm. joy and emotions and really well written characters and fun dialogue and i just can't say i probably didn't skateboard enough in the game mm-hmm. because i was i really wanted to get back to the house yeah and, and uh yeah. and do the battles and stuff like that but um and that's okay. It's, it's really meant to be, you know, really accessible. It is okay. Of, it's cool. You know, you can you can ignore the bits that you don't want to ignore, but it's there for people who like really love their mastery and who are obsessed with completing everything and getting all of the achievements. Love those folks. It is a video game after all. <laughs> it is a video game. Yeah. Those pleasures are available to you should you desire them. So um, I usually like to end these these podcasts with just kind of finding out what's next. And mm-hmm. also, what are you playing? Oh, my gosh. So um, I've been doing some judging for the IGF. So um, loads of things. Um, I just, I actually just did wrote up a little top 10 list for Giant Bomb, which isn't out yet, but I will spoil it. So my top three of the year. This, this won't be out until January. So. Oh, there you go. So you will already yeah. know. So uh, Mediterranean Inferno, um, which is made by the Santa Regione folks, is uh, it's a beautiful gorgeously stylish visual novel there's about three club twinks um going on holiday in i think southern italy uh for three days while also beset by these strange phantasmic um visions that promise them uh bliss but also uh kind of are like microtransactions almost so you have to like give them sun coins in order to like ascend and it's really a story about like on ue and uh young people being born into this world of like impending climate collapse where it feels like there is no future and the sense of alienation um it's about like social media and all of the perverse incentives it's like techno capitalism um and it's a really post-pandemic game so they're meeting up after not having met for many years and they were the, like the queens of the club scene in milan um but the pandemic has isolated all of them and they've all gone in these different directions and they're kind of coming back so that's that's amazing um Cosmic Wheel Sisterhood, uh, which is a kind of, you know, it's almost a game in which you're building building your own tarot deck. And then each of the cards that you play when you do tarot readings um, open up a range of possible futures. And in in picking that, you kind of pick the future of the game. So it's this really interesting meditation on protagonism. Um, it, it, It felt really like alive. Uh, to me in in this way right it's it has this very it, it kind of merges this huge kind of sci-fi premise of like you're a witch and you've been exiled and you make a deal with an otherworldly entity you know 200 years into your exile but then there's also like a real grounded human story about like relationships and 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 a kind of past life and uh, you know and it's Im- really emotionally mature uh and and i think in some ways is so elegant like the core game loop is so comfortable in some ways that it it almost belies how experimental and interesting it is um and then my favorite my real like game of the year this year is a thousand times resist um 
which is made by Sunset Visage. I think it's out um, first quarter next year. Um, and again, in a weirdly similar way, uh, sort of big time sci-fi future premise merged with this really emotional grounded story of, of, so it's made by Sunset Visitor, who are a bunch of uh, Asian diaspora creatives in Canada. And it's about their own response to the Hong Kong protests in 2019 that were cut off uh, by COVID. And so it's like this immigrant narrative nestled within this uh, this this kind of um, sci-fi premise. But it's kind of a little bit of a walking simulator, but the team is made up of like visual artists and musicians and and. Uh, theater makers and it really shows in in the work um and so you're moving through these beautiful tableaus that are just so like well lit and so um just so such gorgeous kind of spaces beautiful level level design as well i i really i really recommend it it's one of the games that really these three games i think all gave me that feeling of because you know when you're shipping a game in a year you a you don't play any games that year so judging was such a nice opportunity to do that and it instead of feeling burnt out, really reinvigorated me about the possibilities of the medium um, and other people's sort of beautiful work. So, um, yeah, I'm super excited. And then I, I also have to finish. I'm in Act 3 of Baldur's Gate 3, so I will probably play that one <laughs> when I'm at home and avoiding my family. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to start that right after Christmas. Um, Excellent. I'll check back in a year or so when you're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or do you get obsessive and, and inside them? I'm a finisher, so I'm oh, I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's like 70 hours pretty much for Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to it, but also not just because it'll be the thing for a long time. For ages. But it's it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful work of art and just uh you know, it's um it feels very bountiful and there's something like a tiny bit janky about it in a in in a in a wonderful way. Um, I think so. Oh, well, I can't wait. You're, you're going to have fun. Yeah. Uh, well, my game of the year um, is the extremely controversial Dave the Diver. Uh, is this an indie game? Yeah. <laughs> but I will tell you that um, Thirsty Suitors will also be on my end of the year list. Not that anyone cares about oh, that, but it will be on the list because okay, it, was, it was just such a great experience. And, you know, everything we already talked about and mm -hmm. uh, just kind of like a wonderful thing to have in games and it's just so great that it exists please yeah. thank the whole team from me team. um it was you know very very emotional very fun very deep and real and i just needed that and so i really appreciate it and it was great to have you on this podcast uh yeah. i've been looking forward to it for a while like i said mm -hmm. you've been on my list so mm -hmm. It was great to great to dig into that, and I am extremely looking forward to whatever it is you do next. Me too. Yes, very exciting. Nothing I can talk about properly yet. Same. Um, you know, but but yeah, um, and and thank you so much, Adam. I mean, I, I'm so I'm so glad it resonated with you, and I think I think that's something as well. Like, it, it is a game that we made for our, us as like. As, as brown people as immigrants as you, do. As, we, yeah. as you do which is such a great opportunity to do that but it's also for everybody <laughs> um and i think that's something i really want to talk about you know because i think it's so isn't that the pleasure of fiction and art to to yes sometimes to see yourself but it's not just meant to be a mirror it can also be a, a portal into um an, a, a space yeah. that is on playing a game like this is like traveling yeah you just like you're gonna get something out of it like no matter what, I like, I don't think anyone can play this game. They don't even have to like it, but they're going to get mm -hmm. something out of it. And really that's like the experience. Like, yeah. so if you're listening and you weren't going to play this game, like really take, just take, take the moment and, and check it out because you will get something out of it. And in the end, that's why we're all doing this anyway. So, yeah. you know, it's a great example of, you know, perseverance, a unique voice, a really um, universal topic, and mm -hmm. just a fucking fun game. <laughs> I think you summed it up beautifully. I don't think I, I need to say anything else. Well, thank you so much. This was great. And uh, looking forward to whatever you're doing next. 
Thank you, Adam. This is wonderful. Right.